Okay, let's talk about MRI of the shoulder. Uh, I'd like to talk about technical considerations uh, for this lecture. Then I'd like to go in and we'll talk about impingement. Then we'll spend some time on rotator cuff disease and then quite a bit of time on instability, labrum, and, and other pathologies. But again, we won't do masses until uh, probably January time frame where we'll get to those. So as far as protocols like, uh, like the knee and other areas of the uh, musculoskeletal system, there are many good ways to do the imaging, and there's no one way that's best for all circumstances. But we generally like to try to take a technique that uh, works best for most things so that we don't have to be changing the, the technical protocols all the time. Uh, of all the areas, yeah, I think it's fair to say that the protocols I like are, are not always the common ones that are used out in ac the academic community in the United States. And this is one where I, I really probably differ more than most others in that, in that I, I really think it's important to have three different techniques in the oblique coronal plane, and I'll explain why. And then uh, uh, axial T1 and axial PD fat sat. And then the oblique sagittal T2, I don't like to fat suppress it. And I'll go through the reasons why I think you lose information when you fat suppress and you don't really gain any information. Uh, but that uh, most people will fat suppress the, uh, the oblique sagittal. Uh, and many people like the, the fat suppressed. They like the black white appearance. But you lose a lot of the subtleties of the signal changes. And uh, as in the, like the ACL, where I think when you fat suppress, you tend to overcall the disease and you, you really lose a lot of contrast and lose a lot of specificity. I think that's especially true in the shoulder. I'd just like to point out in almost all of the shoulder conferences I've gone to, the biggest single complaint that shoulder surgeons have concerning MRI is that it has too high a false positive. Uh, they, they, most of them really like a study that's more specific where they can uh, uh, feel more comfortable in the reliability of the results. And the typical problem is false positives with MRI of the shoulder. We'll talk more about that. So the technique I like to use is a T1-weighted oblique coronal image, a T2-weighted non-fat suppressed, and then a PD fat suppressed. And I like a TE somewhere around 30 to 34 milliseconds at uh, 1.5 Tesla, a little bit less than that at 3 Tesla. And, and we'll explain the, the, in the physics section of why I, the TE should be a little different at 3T versus 1.5T. And that's because of the two different field strengths, the T2 times of the tissues are slightly different. The T2 times becomes less at 3T and we'll explain why from the uh, uh, physical, uh, the biochemistry involved in the process. And therefore, you can shorten the TE a little bit at 3T. That does two things. It maintains the same contrast, but you can actually get further improvement in signal-to-noise by shortening the TE, because as we'll see in the physics section, uh, you'll have less decay time. Uh, so there are several ways that you can win going to 3T. On the axial images, this is just a T1-weighted image and a PD fat sat. The reason I don't like to do T2-weighted, T2 fat sats, is if the TE is much longer like this, you lose a lot of signal, and so you start getting very grainy images, especially at 1.5T. Uh, one advantage of going to the T2-weighted, you can see that the contrast between the fluid and the articular cartilage is better at the higher TE, but I think you lose a lot of other information and so I, I think that we have plenty of sequences where we can see the articular cartilage pretty well. So I think uh, by it's better to use a shorter TE. We can still see the cartilage reasonably well, and uh, we can see a lot of other structures better without as much uh, loss in signal to noise and, and gradiness. But the people who are proponents of the T2 images like it because it primarily gives a better contrast between the fluid and the articular cartilages. Now, this is a 25-year-old Major League Baseball player who had a prior labral repair. Uh, we can see some of the metal artifact that's uh, uh, left in there from the repair. Uh, and this just shows a CT scan where we really see very little density there. So very small little flecks of, of metal can produce rather, rather major uh, susceptibility of metal artifact on the uh, on the MR examinations. And you're all aware of that. It just shows how subtle it can be. Now, at low field, I like to change the protocol a little bit. 
I like to do coronal T1, T2, and instead of the PD fat set, since you can't really do TD, PD fat sets well at low fields, I usually use a stir. Uh, you could use a Dixon technique, uh, depending on whichever fat suppressed sequence is best on the particular skin you're using. And then a T1, axial T1, attack, axial gradient echo, which we used to use at high fields before the fat suppressed sequences became available. And then again, the T2, sagittal T2, with, and you can't do fat suppression at this field anyway, so it's without fat suppression. When we do an arth arthrography, I don't like to image before and after giving the contrast. I usually put the contrast in and just image once after the contrast. A lot of people like to do both. Uh, in the past, it was very popular because you could charge for both and get reimbursed by Medicare, which you can't anymore. Uh, but I've always preferred just to put the contrast in and just scan once to limit the amount of scan time for individuals. Here I changed the protocol a little bit. And then instead of a coronal T1, I do a coronal T1 fat sat. So I do fat sat that. The T2 is still not fat suppressed. The PD is still the same PD. Uh, then I like a, to change the axial T1 to an axial T1 fat sat. And then do a sagittal uh, T2 without fat suppression. So here's a young athlete with shoulder pain. And there's rule out rotator cuff tear. Uh, well, let's see. Why don't we start? Susie, what do you think of this case? Well, I'm not real sure if that's going to be a, a labral recess, but I do see this um, signal intensity within the superior labrum, but it looks really smooth, and I can't really make out most of the inferior labrum. So I'm not sure if he's has a recess or a tear. Okay. Uh, We'll, we'll get to talking about labrum a while. I can agree with you that, that there is some concern about this labrum. We'd need to see multiple images on either side. Uh, what do you think about the signal here within the supraspinatus muscle? Well, on one of these, um, on the far right that says T2, the signal intensity is heterogeneous, and also on the PD fat sat. Whether it's true atrophy or whether it's artifact, I'm not sure. Yeah, and then this you can see here, this is a T1 fat set, so there's contrast in the joint space. And if you look at this, this is high signal intensity. It's on the T2. It's not so high on the T1, but we can see a little bit of funny signal there. And this kind of linear low signal structure here, yeah, which we can kind of magnify it a little bit there. And this was just a they injected the first in the supraspinatus tendon before they got into the joint space. So I just want to make people aware with uh, when you do uh, arthrogram injection is that you may see a lot of funny artifacts in the surrounding soft tissues, especially if you're not the one doing the injections and just be aware of that. Uh, this was all, this is a little bit of air that they injected with the contrast. And uh, uh, here they, they actually injected into the rotator cuff interval, which, uh, and we could see when they did that injection, some of the some of the contrast extended into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and just remember that the sub. We'll talk about this later. The the subacromial subdeltoid bursa extends anteriorly down, and often in about 50 per, 60 percent of individuals communicates with the subcoracoid bursa. And therefore, when you inject through the rotator cuff interval, which is our most people's preferred uh, access now to doing injections, uh, you often get contrast along that track, and it can actually go into the, the, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa when it comes anteriorly there. And you can get a little bit of contrast into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Notice that the rotator cuff is intact here. Uh, there's no evidence of going through it. But just be aware that that's one of the potential problems that you can have when you inject through the rotator cuff interval, unless your technique is perfect. So this, uh, this, this actually isn't a uh, contrast from a rotator cuff tear. It's not coming from the joint space. There's the actual needle tract, and you can see contrast extending along the needle tract here. And this happens to be that bursa. And so you get a little bit of bursa fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and because of the injection, and not because of the actual rotator cuff tear. I, I think somebody has a lot of noise. Could they mute, could they mute your uh, microphone?
Okay, I'm going to have to mute it because there's someone else in the office. If you want me to take another case, I don't know what to do. You want to send me an email? Uh, uh, I'll just, you'll listen to me, so I'll just. Yeah, uh, I'll just okay, I'm going to mute it. it on. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so just be aware that when you see tracks like this, you can, because that subacromial subdeltoid bursa can come forward and, and communicate with the sub coracoid bursa, which is down here. We'll talk about that more later. You can inadvertently get contrast in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa when there's not a rotator cuff tear. Okay, now in terms of uh, technical aspects, the most important thing I think in imaging, you, you certainly have to have images that give you contrast for pathology. Uh, but the, the biggest error that I see all the time in MR is not having adequate spatial resolution to make a diagnosis. Uh, if back in, I don't know what year it was, probably about 1989, 1990 in that time frame, uh, there were back-to-back -back articles from one month to the next in the journal Radiology where they were looking at the accuracy of MR at looking at labral tears. Uh, both, uh, there are two different academic institutions. Both were using the same equipment, 1.5T uh, state-of-the-art equipment at that particular time. Uh, <clears throat> one group said that MR was no better than flipping a coin at looking at labral tears, and the other one said that MR had a 95% accuracy rate at evaluating labral tears, and they recommended it as the technique of choice for looking at labral tears. If you look at their technique, their technique was almost identical except for one thing. The, uh, the site that showed that MR was not able to evaluate uh, labral tears accurately used a 24 centimeter field of view in acquiring its images. The site that had very high uh, accuracy rate had a 12 centimeter field of view. Otherwise, everything was almost identical. And this is just an example. This was a, from a... a uh, volunteer that we had around that same time period and this is scanning at a 24 centimeter field of view same exact person and this is at a 12 centimeter field of view here we can actually see the articular cartilage and if you look at the superior labrum uh, you can see the, uh, the nice normal articular cartilage coming underneath the superior labrum notice how it's nice and smooth and has a curvilinear appearance to it if you go over here again this is the same patient it's just lower spatial resolution here we can see a linear a line there, but it's very straight. A straight line is usually, or an irregular line, typically means a tear. But in this particular case, this is what we're looking at. We just don't have the resolution to adequately evaluate it properly. So spatial resolution is very important. And uh, <clears throat> well, there was there were some similar studies around 1990 and looking at menisci of the knee, uh, which had similar results. One study. Uh, from an orthopedic group here in Los Angeles said that MR was, was worthless at evaluating meniscal tears, uh, and that was about a year after we published our initial data showing that MR was very accurate. But again, the difference was that they were scanning both knees together in one large field of view. We were scanning an, uh, individual knees using small fields of view. So I just want to emphasize resolution. Why? Because I still see repeatedly uh, sites from all over the place where people are scanning at high fields of view and don't have the adequate resolution. And this is especially apparent when people use low field scanners. If you go, most of the manufacturers out there for low field scanners, when they recommend scanning protocols for the shoulder, they recommend it somewhere between 22 and 18 centimeter fields of view, which are way too large. And, and they also have small matrices so that they have big voxels so that they get good signal to noise. So they're pretty looking images to people who don't know what they're looking for. The spatial resolution is critically important and you should never image, a sh if you image a shoulder with greater than a 16 centimeter field of view for the images that are sensitive for uh, labral disease, then either you're taking a lot of time having too big of a matrix, which usually isn't the problem, and you'll get a lot of motion artifact, or you're just not going to have the spatial resolution to, to, to make a diagnosis. So even at low field, it's important to make sure you have small fields of view so you can do efficient imaging. And at low field, the images should be grainy. If they're not grainy, then you either have too large of voxels or you're taking way too much time to do the imaging. And uh, most equipment manufacturers will get upset because they look grainy and that makes their equipment look bad, but it gives you much better diagnostic uh, 
uh, quality images when you do that. So field of view is very important. Now, anatomy, I don't think we have to go through much of this now uh, in this day and age. Let me just briefly go through this. This is the scapula. Anteriorly is to the left. Posteriorly is to your right. This muscle here is underneath the scapula, and therefore it's called the subscapularis muscle. There it is. It's a very big muscle, very important. And if we go above the scapula into the suprascapular regions, then we get the suprascapular, uh, uh, the uh, supraspinatus, excuse me. This is the spine back here. Above the spine is the supraspinatus muscle. Below the spine is the infraspinatus muscle, and the teres minor sits down, down here. If we go further out laterally, we can start seeing part of the tendon of the subscapularis tendon, the distal part of the supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus muscle, and now we're seeing a better definition of the teres minor muscle. And we can just go farther out. Here we're starting to see the biceps, going head of the biceps tendon. The oblique sagittal images are excellent images to evaluate the biceps tendon proximally, and you should evaluate that all the time. This is the Let's see, anybody know what this ligament is here? This is an important or ligament that you always have to evaluate. Michael? Coracohumeral ligament. That's a, uh, uh, that's a coracohumeral ligament, and it's very important, as we'll talk about later. Uh, you have to evaluate this all the time and look for scar tissue around it, but we'll, we'll come to that later. Okay, and if we go into the axial plane, yeah, uh, again, I think you all know this anatomy. This is the inner tuberous groove. This is lesser tuberosity, the greater tuberosity, the long head of the biceps tendon within the groove itself. Here we're seeing part of the inferior labrum. And, uh, and this is the uh, anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament. The posterior band is back here, and it really attaches here to, to the labrum. Uh, if we go farther up, uh, here we see the anterior and posterior labrum. This is the middle glenohumeral ligament, uh, which we'll talk a lot more about in a minute. Uh, it should go down and fuse with the anterior capsule. And here's the more proximal part of the middle glenohumeral ligament. Here's the anterior superior labrum. And then uh, one cut up, we'd, we'd probably have a ligament coming across here, which is the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament. In the coronal plane, this is the uh, middle glenohumeral ligament coming down to that origin of the anterior superior labrum. Uh, superior glenohumeral ligament and middle glenohumeral ligament, and here the uh, middle glenohumeral ligament comes down and fuses with the anterior capsule in that location. Could I just ask a question? Are you using an arrow to show these things because it doesn't show up on the screen? This, the arrow doesn't show up on the screen? No, I don't see any arrow at all over the past um, several slides that you've discussed. Do you guys not see an arrow either? <laughs> I see an arrow. Oh, man. OK, sorry, I don't. Uh, I'll try to be a little bit more descriptive, uh, Susie. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, okay. so let's look at some congenital lesions here. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Yuri. What, what do you see here? OK, we got an axial. Uh, Axial view uh, of the shoulder. Um, it's an actual PD fat side of the shoulder. Okay. Yeah, right. um, there's a abnormal abnormal uh, signal noted within the uh, um, within the posterior um, uh, labrum. Um, Back here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, this is probably the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament coming around, and that's its attachment there. This is probably the labrum, and in this particular case, the labrum is actually okay. There's just a little bit of signal irregularity at the, uh, uh, at the junction between the, uh, the uh, capsular ligament and the labrum itself. What I'm concerned about is what's this defect in the central part of the glenoid here? Um. Right there, and that's uh, that's just it has different names. Some people just call it a central defect. This is thought to be a normal variant and uh, shouldn't be misinterpreted as a articular cartilage lesion. You also have a similar lesion that you can see in the acetabulum of the hip, which is often called a stellate lesion in that location. But we'll get to that in the hip. 
I just want to point this out as it's a uh, recognized uh, normal variant. I could be called the bear. I've never heard it called the bear area, but that that's that could be a, a reasonable name for it. There are other areas like for the uh, lunate in the wrist where there's a bear area that's not covered by articular cartilage. And some people may call that a bear area as well. That would be reasonable, though I'm not used to that term. I read like an article on normal variants and labrum. It, I think there were two areas that they called the bare area. This is one of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're dealing with here is a bit, kind of a defect in the cartilage, not the labrum, right? This is kind of more central in the cartilage. Yes, area. this is cartilage. Right. This is cartilage. So it's a, just a normal variant. Okay. Uh, Oh, let's see. Sheila, what do you think of this case? Okay. Okay. So it looks like there's, let's see, maybe like an abnormal appearance of the anterior. Oh, okay. So is that the middle glen? No sure what that is. Is that the glenohumeral ligament? No. I can't tell you either. All right. This, uh, this is uh, one of the more uh, obscure ones. This is called the anomalous insertion of the pectoralis minor tendon, and it goes off from the direction of the pectoralis minor. And it's just something that you may want to kind of review is uh, this is a uh, you, have, you need to see a lot of these, but that's that's an anomalous tendon insertion that comes up there. But again, it's a normal variant that uh, uh, shouldn't be misinterpreted. Okay. Where is it insert? Where is the spinal insertion? In fact, it's not on the coracoid. Where's the rotator angle? Yeah, it's inserts. It's right up in. It's up to the glenoid. Okay, a 41-year-old male with shoulder pain. And here again, we can see a little uh, congenital uh, lesion there coming up anteriorly. Again, in that location here, we can see it coming from the chromium. Uh, again, another anomalous insertion of the pectoralis minor that comes around here anteriorly over the coracoid process. Up to the glenoid. So about 1%. Okay, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, we have a 23-year-old male, pain after injury. There are multiple axial images here, and um, okay, yeah, I was looking, and the I don't see a biceps tendon there, but I don't really see a good good groove as well. Exactly. This, as you see, there is not a well-developed groove here, uh, and that's really what's important for this diagnosis. Otherwise, it's almost always going to be a tear with distal retraction of the biceps mm -hmm. tendon. But this turned out to be uh, uh, one with a poorly, poorly developed groove. With... So this is this is a rare congenital absence of the biceps tendon. Long head. Yes. Short head is still there. So let's talk a little bit about the biceps tendon anatomy then. Uh, uh, if this is looking at the shoulder from anteriorly, we can see the supraspinatus subscapularis. Uh, this is the biceps tendon coming up here, the long head of the biceps tendon. It goes up through the intertuberous grooves. It's held in place there by the transverse ligament, which are superficial fibers coming from the subscapularis uh, tendon. They go over the groove. Uh, they have a bony attachment to the lesser tuberosity uh, and then go over the groove and attach to the greater tuberosity. And it helps stabilize the biceps tendon and the uh, bicipital groove. But in addition to that, uh, you have the uh, 
<clears throat> superior glenohumeral ligament, which comes off the superior part of the glenoid and actually comes under the biceps tendon and wraps around it. And here we can see the coracohumeral ligament above this. And this, this uh, supraspinatus, uh, I said the superior glenohumeral ligament coming underneath the biceps also helps keep the biceps from dislocating anteriorly. And this is called the sling mechanism of the biceps tendon within the shoulder. Uh, and, we'll, and I'll show examples of that and how, what you look for to, to see that later on when we talk about biceps disease. And I show different levels of pathology and different levels of dislocation. We kind of have our own uh, 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 grading system that I like to use. Again, I don't put the grade in the report, but to think about the different stages, I think we have about seven stages of uh, instability of the biceps tendon. Uh, some of those have, have been published in the literature, but not all of them. So, so then the stability of the biceps tendon is dependent not just on the transverse humeral and coracohumeral ligaments, that the actual superior glenohumeral ligament needs to be torn or damaged for the various stages? That's Yeah, it's more, complica yeah, it's more complicated than that also. Uh, the also important in the stability are the tendons of the supraspinatus and subscapularis uh, muscles as well. They also have to be torn before you can get a dislocation of the biceps tendon. And that was first described really in about 2003 by Habermeyer and also by Bennett in the orthopedic literature. And we'll talk about that when we talk about disease of the biceps, but that'll be in a later lecture. Okay, uh, let's talk about some of the technical considerations and looking at uh, rotator cuff disease. I'm going to talk about issues that have to do with fat suppression, uh, arthrography, and uh, T2 fat set, T1 fat set versus T2. Now, what do we look for in, for rotator cuff disease? Well, uh, uh, Richard Hawkins, uh, I think he's now in South Carolina, uh, but he was uh, in, in Canada and then moved, moved down to Vail and worked at the uh, uh, Stedman Hawkins Clinic in Vail for a number of years, who's a shoulder surgeon. And these are the seven things that he wants to see described in any uh, MR report, especially when it comes to the shoulder and the rotator cuff. Uh, if there's a tear, he wants to know the size of the tear. We typically measure it in two different directions. He wants to know the quality of tissues adjacent to the tear, and I'll explain how we evaluate that. The location of the tear, whether there's fatty infiltration into the muscles is one of the more reliable ways to help determine whether a large rotator cuff tear is likely to be repairable or not. Uh, if there's elevation of the humeral head, what the acromial morphology is, and the status of the biceps tendon. So we'll, we'll be talking about those. That will be more than one lecture to get through all of that. Now, in looking for MR, it, we can look at uh, MR uh, acquisition techniques and what we find is looking at sensitivity versus specificity. If we're looking for the sensitivity for a rotator cuff tear, then MR arthrography is probably has the highest sensitivity because some very small tears, you can just see a little bit of contrast going through the tear. PD fat set is next. And PD fat set, however, is much more sensitive for the tendinosis, which is the common precursor of tears which we'll talk about also in a minute, the pathophysiology that leads to a tear. And the non-fat SAT T2 has the uh, uh, lowest sensitivity. And the reason a lot of people have moved away from doing the non-fat SAT T2 is it does have a low sensitivity. The problem when we look at specificity is that MR arthrography uh, has a high specificity for full thickness tears, but if, they, if the tear does not communicate with the joint space, then you can completely miss it on an arthrogram, especially if you only use T1-weighted uh, fat sat images. So MR arthrography can be very specific for full thickness tears, but it can completely miss very significant partial, uh, partial tears, especially if they're bursal side tears. Uh, so there are problems with arthrography. Uh, overall, uh, the non-fat suppressed non-fat suppressed T2 is much more specific for a tear than is the PD fat sat. And if you're dealing with professional athletes, it's really the non-fat sat T2, which is, in my opinion, the critical image. Because you, you, as we will talk about, you do not want to 
overdiagnose these, especially in professional athletes or people who really use their shoulder a lot. Uh, uh, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that. The PD fat sat, again, is sensitive, but it's very, very, quite common to get false positives if you just use the PD fat sat, which is a problem and one of the reasons why MR has developed a, a reputation among a lot, of sport, a lot of sports medicine surgeons as being uh, having too many false positives. Well, that's why I don't believe in arthrograms of the shoulder. We could make too many diagnoses for somebody to cut on. If it's uh, something worth cutting, we ought to be able to see it without an arthrogram. If you can't see it with a normal MR without uh, contrast, then it's, it's, you shouldn't be uh, looking for anything more. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I agree. I agree there. I don't. When we do MR arthrography, we do not do it for rotator cuff disease. There are some people who do because there are some people who believe in doing surgery for partial tears if they're greater than 50% of the thickness of the tendon. Uh, so it depends upon the orthopedic surgeon you're working with. Uh, but we'll talk, we'll talk more about that, uh, about that later. But when we do MR arthrography of the shoulder, we recommend it for some young athletes. It's primarily to better visualize the labrum, not the rotator cuff. Uh, so let's talk about a few of these issues now. And, and again, I, right now I'm just talking about pulse sequences. We'll actually talk about the pathophysiology of rotator cuff disease in a later talk. Right now, I just want to concentrate on why we use the pulse sequences that we use in order to diagnose the shoulder. Okay. So here's a, here's a patient who came in with a, a shoulder pain and rule out rotator cuff tear. Uh, let's see, Aram, what do you, th Aram, what do you think of this? Um, we have a T1-weighted sequence uh, coronally. Um, to me, the muscle looks somewhat wavy and slightly retracted and, you know, perhaps some mild fatty atrophy in it. Again, the tear itself is not well visualized on a T1 sequence, but I think you could probably imagine that there is probably a tear there and it's retracted. Moving on to a proton density, again, once again, there seems there's a large full thickness tear of the tendon with retraction. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So that's the PD fat set, and this is the T2 non fat set. And here, what, what we have found in surgical correlation studies that we've published is that the, if you wanted to get an accurate size of the tear, and by the way, these are hard to measure at arthroscopy to get an accurate measurement there, but we've generally found that the T2 non fat suppress gives you the best measurement. And the reason for this is here, you would typically measure from there probably all the way down to here. But what we can see is this is actually abnormal tissue, but it's, it's actually, we can see that there is tendon attached to the foot plate there, that the tear is actually within the tendon itself and not at the foot plate. And that can be much more difficult to determine on the PD fat set alone, but it's much easier to determine on the T2. Uh, also, what you often find is that the margins of the tear are much better delineated on the T2 than they are on the PD fat set, which allows you to actually do more reproducible measurements of the tear. And uh, some people believe that the surgery that sh should be performed is different depending upon the size of the tear. In particular, you may use a double row versus a single row technique, or there's some people, if it's a very large tear, will still prefer to do it open rather than arthroscopically. So the size and the location of the tear may be helpful to some orthopedic surgeon. Well, the most important thing about doing surgery on these is, uh, is the chronicity of the uh, problem. How old is the injury? Uh, is, it, is it a degenerative tear or is it an acute uh, athletic tear? There's a big difference in, in the results. The older the tear, the worse results you get. The results uh, in the shoulder surgery are not that great anyway. And I think you'll see some cases that uh, Dr. Cal is going to show us. So. And, and the best way we can try to approach that is by looking at the, the integrity of the soft tissues. And what uh, 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 Dr. Hawkins was talking about, if you have the normal tendon should be black on the PD fat set and black on the T2. If you have bright on both, that's a tear. 
If you have bright on the PD fat set and dark on the T2, that's area of, of tissue, but it's not normal tissue. And the more uh, tissue you have like that, which is more of a tendinotic tissue, the more likely it's a chronic type tear and the, uh, and the more likely if you repair it, that it's going to, the, the, the surgical constructs will break down. And, and therefore you have a worse prognosis, the more uh, tendinotic tissue you have adjacent to the tear. Of course, I think the muscle is probably more important than any of this. Uh, is it atrophy? Then how far atrophied is it in, in terms of uh, percentage? And we'll get to that later too. Yep, that's right. But the more chronic a lesion, the worse the result. And whether you do a double row, single row, triple row, quadruple row, ain't going to make any difference. You're making up surgeries. <laughs> yeah, that just makes the surgery a lot more difficult. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this, the, and this is the reason, the, the primary reason that I like to include a non-fat suppressed T2 weighted sequence. Uh, which we, yeah, and then uh, looking at contrast again, here we have now contrast in the joint space. Here's a T1 weighted image, and we can see that there's absorption of a lot of the contrast in the area. This is probably the tear going through the supraspinatus tendon, but this increased signal on the T1 weighted images within the tendon itself is due to the tendon uh, abnormally imbibing the contrast and the contrast absorbing onto free ends of the collagen which have been torn and frayed. Uh, so that's abnormal. The normal tendon should not stain with the gadolinium contrast. So that's also an indication that you've got a lot of tendinosis around an area of a tear. And here we can see the contrast going into the subacromial subdeltoid versa. That's a T1. This is the PD fat set. And here's the T2 weighted image. And again, notice on these small tears, you get you don't get great contrast with T2. And that's why I think you still have to have the PD fat set, but you need to look at the two together to come up with the diagnosis. And here's what we can see is that there's a small full thickness defect with a lot of tendinosis around it, uh, allowing contrast to flow through the defect. So it's a full thickness tear. There's no proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction. So that's actually a T1. It's a PD, not a T1 fat set post, the middle one? The middle one has a, T, is a TE somewhere around 27 to 30. So it's a it's more of a PD fat suppressed sequence. I just wonder what, what the tear looks like in the AP direction in terms of distance. Yeah, I don't have that here. I'm just yeah, it, it probably is not big in the AP direction, but this is just to show what the contrast looks like with the different techniques. And then here, this just shows another example of a partial tear going to the bursal side surface, seen very nicely on the PD fat set. Uh, not so nicely on the T2-weighted image, but again, I think the T2 still gives us in, uh, important information here. Uh, but the reason a lot of people have stopped using it is that they like the more black and white contrast of the PD fat set images, uh, which for these partial tears I think is an advantage. But uh, uh, the more important full thickness tears and size considerations, I think the, the T2 non-fat suppressed is, is, a, is a critically important image. There. Let's see. Okay, here's just another case of a T1 weighted image where we can see that there's clearly been a big tear here, but the T1 weighted image, we don't see contrast very well. We don't see the muscle here, so the end of the muscle has been retracted medially. Uh, here's the PD fat set. And here, what we see is, is a, a large tear distally here. This is the foot plate. We can see part of the end of the tendon there, but if you look carefully, you can also see that there is a the inferior part of the tendon is actually torn here and retracted even further. So there actually, there's a little bit of tissue that's still intact. There is a mildly retracted component that's a superficial portion of the supraspinatus and a much more severely uh, retracted inferior portion of the, of the tendon. And you can see these also on the T2 weighted image. So we have different contrasts, which gives us different information between the two. Uh, this is often called a pasta lesion, which we'll talk about later. Quality of the tissues, we've talked a little bit about this already. Here's just an example where we can see the T1 fat set with, con with an arthrogram technique, a PD fat set in the T2. And then what we can see on the T2 weighted image is this is really the distal end of the tendon. The tendon actually comes all the way out to here. 
Here is uh, this is tendinotic tendon, which has imbibed the contrast and therefore enhanced with the contrast uh, very prominently on the T1 fat sat image. And we can see less enhancement on the PD fat sat image. But again, the actual size of the tear is best seen on the T2 weighted images here. And we can actually see the difference between the uh, T1 and the PD fat sat versus the T2, that this is a, a markedly tendinotic tendon distally here. Yeah, there, there, there probably is, but we didn't. Yeah, there probably is some. Yeah, we, we'd need to see all the sequence to evaluate that. So, and that's uh, looking at integrity. Magic angle artifact, I'm sure you've all heard about. We'll talk more about that in the physics lectures. Uh, but here we can see a little bit of increased signal intensity within the tendon, right where the fibers uh, cut at 55 degrees. The uh, z-axis here is up and down. Uh, the fibers, when they get around 55 degrees, it causes a shortening of the T2 time and therefore increased signal intensity within the tendon on short TE image. If you go to longer TE images, you get less of an effect. And this is a PD fat set. If we went to a T2 weighted sequence, you would see uh, no increased signal intensity there at all uh, if it's magic angle artifact. And here's the T2 sequence with just a strided pattern without a focal area of increased signal intensity. But we'll talk more about magic angle artifact later. You always get it in uh, if you use superconducting magnets with a linear uh, direction of the magnetic field up and down. Uh, we, in, if you do vertical field scanners in the knee, you'll see it in the meniscus, anteriorly and posteriorly within the menisci. Uh, we typically see it in the Achilles tendon all the time. There are characteristic areas that you'll see over and over again this year where we'll see magic angle artifact, and we tend to just completely not even see it uh, once you've had a lot of experience with it. But if you're concerned, uh, you can go to longer TE images, and it should go away. And we'll explain why it should go away when we talk about the physics section. Now, there are some other problems with, with arthrograms. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Susie, why don't you go ahead and turn your mic on. And uh, what do you think is happening here on, on this particular supraspinatus tendon? This patient came in with shoulder pain, rule out, rotator cuff tear. Hey, Susie, are you still with us? Well, why don't we move yes, on? I'm, yes, I'm still with you. I'm just trying to get this thing to go on and work correctly. Sorry about that. A wonderful world of technology. Okay, okay. so what do you think of this supraspinatus tendon? I think there's a complete tear of the supraspinatus tendon Okay. Now, near its footprint. Okay, and on the PD fat set, it certainly looks like there is fluid going right through a defect. Right through it, yes. Yeah, on the T1 fat set, it's not quite as convincing. Uh, uh, this actually is not an abnormal thing to see at all, this particular pattern right here. Now let's look at the T2 weighted sequence, and there's the T2. Now looking at the T2, what do you think is happening here? Oh, dear. Um. Maybe it's just a partial tear, and the other part of it could have been artifact. Yeah, let me tell you. There's certainly abnormal signal intensity. This patient went to surgery, uh, and the rotator, the supraspinatus tendon was perfectly normal at surgery. Oh, my God. And, and, and I, I want to point this out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, 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 this is not an isolated finding. And what you see actually here is a regularity of the acromion. And what we have here is a degree of tendinosis due to acromial impingement. The rotator cuff is intact. It's just imbibing the contrast and enhancing due to the underlying degenerative change of the tendon itself. But at surgery, this was completely intact. They then put the scope into the, uh, into the bursa here, shaved off a little bit of the acromion. And, uh, and closed up. So I just want people to be aware of this. If you just have T1 fat set and PD fat sets with arthrography, uh, that this is not an uncommon type finding, which leads to false positives. So that's, 
the major reason why I still like to do the non-fat suppressed T2s. It looks, like there's fluid in the, it looks like there's fluid in the bursa on the PD fat sat images. That's what's really like confusing. There is fluid in the bursa. There's fluid right here in the bursa, and there's fluid right here in the bursa. And that's due to bursitis secondary to the impingement. But it's not, it's not actually a communication through a tear in the tendon itself. I'm not sure that that guy didn't get extravasated by the needle where it went. That's one of the problems I think we have here. But basically the, what's going on here, the PD is over-exaggerating the signal, making it look like fluid as opposed to tendinosis. Yes, and you could say, well, the T1-weighted image, it looks like the tendon is intact, but uh, there's a lot of signal there. And, and uh, the vast majority of people I know, if these are the only two sequences they had, they would call this a, a full thickness rotator cuff tear, even though there's no proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction. Uh, but the T2 weighted image, I think, really helps here. And, it, and also, arthroscopically, you don't always see these um, small lesions either. Uh, there may be a lesion there, but it's so small that uh, it's not uh, complete in terms of where you, where you can see with the arthroscope. Yeah, especially peripherally out here in this location. Yeah, when you get out the edges of that attachment at the foot plate area, you, you can't see them things as well uh, through the bursa and so on. Sometimes a surgeon will go inside the bursa and, and, and miss the lesion entirely. Okay, so th this is just a kind of warning and just to explain uh, why I still like to use the T2. And the T2 sequence is only about a two minute sequence. So it doesn't add a lot in time for the patient on the scanner, but it's certainly, I think, very, very important for uh, accurate diagnoses. Okay, uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay, um, so we got uh, sagittal uh, images of the, of no, the this shoulder. Is, this is a coronal. These are oblique coronals. Oops, sorry, coronal. Oblique coronals. Um, there's uh, increased signal intensity within the uh, articular surface of the supraspinatus, but I don't really see it on the T2 um, ex exactly. Okay. Um, you know, initially on the first two sequences, T1 and, and PD, I would think it was a partial thickness tear, um, and it still may be. Uh, but but given the intermediate nature of signal, it's probably just some tendinosis, tendinopathy. Okay. Good. Uh, this uh, this I just want to point out. Uh, this turned out to be a partial tear. And what, what we'll find out later when we talk about rotator cuff tears is that you should, even on, especially on the PD fat set, uh, all the tendon, you should see a black line at the bottom here. Even if you have a lot of tendinosis, if it's just tendinosis, you still should have the surface of the tendon intact as a little black line, which we don't see here. Uh, and this was a partial tear involving about 50% of the thickness of the tendon. And I just want to point out how the T2 images are not very good for looking at partial tears. Uh, again, a reason why a lot of people don't do the T2-weighted images. Uh, when you're looking for partial tears, I don't even use the T2 in, in the technique. And the, probably the reason is, is that there's a lot of tissue that's, that's kind of compacted in there so that you don't have a nice pocket of free fluid uh, in, these kind of, in these kind of lesions. And a lot of these are probably uh, partial tears going in they're still uh, imbibing, there's still tissue in there that's imbibed the contrast, so it looks very bright here, but the T2s are not very accurate for partial tears. For some surgeons, that's important. There are a few surgeons who like to operate and debreed partial tears. <clears throat> uh, not everybody thinks that that's necessary. Generally, there are, there's one paper in the literature that suggests if it's greater than 50% of the thickness of the tendon, uh, that might be an operable lesion, though certainly the surgeons that I deal with more and more now are veering away from doing surgery on partial partial tears. I think it, a lot depends on the athletic abilities and, and what the muscle looks like because uh, the repairs, like I said, they don't always turn out as well as we'd like. Uh, shoulder surgeries, uh, don't do it if you don't have to. 
Okay, so this was a partial tear. Okay, here's a 15-year-old baseball pitcher with shoulder pain. Uh, here is the PD fat sat pre, and we can see a little bit of increased, kind of diffuse increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon here. And here is the post, and on the post, we can actually see that there is, looks like a defect, a partial tear here. We don't see a nice black line here. Uh, so it really looks like there's a partial tear of the inferior surface. Now, uh, what most shoulder surgeons who deal with baseball players have found, uh, and this is clearly in the literature, is that in general, uh, if, you, uh, if you do rotator cuff surgery on a baseball player, especially if they're pit pitcher, that is career-ending surgery. There have been a number of pitchers including one recent couple of years ago that was traded from the Dodgers because he had a full thickness rotator cuff tear, was traded to one of our nemesis teams for the, for the Angels, and the next year, his first year pitching with a known full thickness rotator cuff tear, he won the Cy Young Award and, and beat us in the playoffs, and went, they went to the World Series and won the World Series. So uh, what has been shown is that Major League Baseball pitchers can actually do very well with full thickness rotator cuff tears. But most of them that have been operated on have not been able to go back into full activity. So we'll talk about some of the criteria for what may cause pain and dysfunction with rotator cuff tears when we get to that section. I, I think in, in pitching, uh, these are kind of freaks of nature. I don't like the term freaks, but they're not normally normal anatomy type of folks. You can't be a pitcher with a normal anatomy. You just can't throw that ball 110 miles an hour. And yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll get into that later, but... Uh, we'll talk, we'll talk about the anatomic changes which have to occur to become a Major League Baseball pitcher. To be there to be able to do it. Okay. Techniques, here's just we can see a patient who's got a lot of disease in the distal supraspinatus tendon. Again, it looks like a, a, the inferior portion of the tendon is torn and retracted much more than the superior portion. Uh, here are T1 fat set images. And if we go to the T2 weighted images, what we actually see is that there is some continuity of the tissues here. But notice there's marked proximal retraction of the muscular tendonous junction. What we're seeing in this particular case here uh, just so that everybody's confused when we leave here. This is actually the distal end of the tendon here in this location. What we see here is not normal tendon. This is called scar in situ. And if you get a tear of the, of the tendon and you, get prox you start getting proximal retraction, the body tries to heal it and it heals it with scar tissue. And you can actually get retraction of the muscular tendonous junction, but actually continuity of the tendon by, uh, by uh, scar tissue. And it's called scar in situ. And this is important because this does not have the mechanical integrity of normal tendon. And if you go in, it's very friable. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. But the other thing that you should be aware of is this scar in situ. So when you see a lot of proximal retraction of the muscular tendonous junction and the tendon is looks like it's much longer than it should be, then that's not normal. And it's not normal tendon. So that's actually the end of the tendon. This is a full thickness tear in this location with a little bit of a pasta lesion coming underneath there. And this is all scar in situ, but we'll talk more about that later. And this can be seen nicely. And the T2-weighted images help here as well. Taking all of the morphology into, attack, into account, uh, we can actually see that this is scar in situ much more readily than we can see on the PD fat set uh, with arthrography. And, and, I'll, and I'll show some... Uh, some uh, surgical correlation with this later. Uh, Dr. Cruz. Yes. Is there any like is there any objective criteria for like the retraction or is it just kind of eyeball it, you know? Well uh, the 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 muscular tendonous junction in the properly positioned shoulder, and it has to be positioned properly. The hand can't be above the head when you do this measurement. The hand has to be the arm has to be at the side. The uh, the muscular tendonous junction should be between the 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock position on the, uh, on the humeral head on the uh, uh, right side and the 11 to 12 o'clock position on the left side. 
Uh, th this just shows uh, some problems with our tomography here. We can see on a T2-weighted image, we can, well, we can see that there's a little partial tear that the foot plate insertion. We, we can see some fluid here. Now, this is native fluid. Notice how bright it is. Notice that the contrast fluid is not so bright because if you have contrast, it shortens the T2 if it's too, if it's too dense. And this lower signal intensity here is contrast material. Here we can see the T1 uh, plus contrast. We can see there's a slack tear. And uh, in this particular case, we can see a little bit of contrast getting into the, to the tear. But notice that the fluid here is not contrast. So uh, it's very important that you have some sort of a fluid sensitive sequence when, when you do these studies. This shows that there is fluid in the subacromial subdelta adversa, probably from bursitis, but it's at this point not freely communicating with the joint space. And that changed, and therefore, uh, this fluid is not from a full thickness or uh, supraspinatus tendon tear. This is just a partial tear. And then we can see the uh, superior, the slap tears, the T2-weighted images are not at all sensitive to slap tears. So you, you really shouldn't even uh, try to evaluate the superior labrum on the T2-weighted images. And you know, I think our time is up at this point. Why don't we stop here and we'll, we'll continue at this point tomorrow and try to get through all the technical stuff about the shoulder. Okay, any questions? Okay, we'll bring it up tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, yep.